Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can be better connected with their loved ones and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is I lost my brother, Robbie, twice, first to hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then later he succumbed to complications from that. I am the E of ENT. I only treat ears. I've performed over 10,000 surgeries in my career, and I have taken care of thousands of patients with hearing loss. I've, I'm the author of a book called Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to www.listenuphearing.com. And in terms of my clinical practice, you can just go to www.azhear.com. We have a repeat guest here. It's uh, Dr. Drew Dundas. He is the Chief Technology Officer at EarLens. He obtained his audiology and biomedical engineering PhD at Vanderbilt University, and he had a master's uh, from the University of Akron. Um, he is an excellent person to talk about hearing aids and rehabilitation and some of the concepts of why there are different things you need to do and why people need to be more aggressive about treating their hearing loss. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I, I really appreciate him coming on. Drew, thanks for coming on to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here again, Mark. Thanks for having me. So, you know, um, we were talking uh, and have talked before about hearing aids and where people are and in terms of treatment. And, and I know that you've had many hats, right? You were a research, uh, head of research at Starkey. Is that what you were? Or uh, I was a research audiologist. It's a research audiologist at Starkey. For some of the listeners, Starkey is, is one of the, it's the only American-based uh, hearing aid manufacturer, major manufacturer. And so um, you had shown me a poster presentation that you did. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the research and uh, what the research found? It's fascinating. I know I've asked you some questions about it, but, but just kind of give a big overview about that research. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Adrian Lister, and I were really interested in understanding more about what people did when with devices when they were fitting them for patients. So what did clinicians actually do? Um, we were particularly interested in deriving new fitting algorithms with the thinking being very manufacturer specific, that ideally you want to start that person out with a fitting that is going to be acceptable to them that is going to provide them with good sound quality and is going to provide them with benefit from the manufacturer's standpoint those things might have different weightings than they might for the for the clinician or for the patient you know the patient would obviously like to have maximum benefit with maximum sound quality and maximum Perfect. acceptability, <laughs> but sometimes you have to balance those things out a little bit. Um, there were several different uh, academically developed fitting algorithms for hearing loss that were really sort of commonly used in, in the hearing industry at the time that we uh, published this, uh, this poster at the International uh, Conference for Hearing Aids up at Lake Tahoe. Uh, and those algorithms have different underlying ideas behind them. But the idea for any fitting algorithm is that you want to prescribe the amount of gain or amplification as well as compression within each of the different frequency regions of the cochlea to help to most effectively and comfortably and naturally sounding uh, compensate for the hearing loss that the individual has in each of those regions. Uh, different algorithms have different underlying philosophies. They have different underlying assumptions. And manufacturer algorithms generally try to lean more towards making okay. sure that the fitting's acceptable, right. right? Minimize returns for credit. That's the business imperative. Uh, while you know, making sure that there's some benefit, but make sure that the hearing aid doesn't turn into a boomerang and come right back to you. Uh, what we were really interested in was figuring out if we looked at these four different types of fitting algorithms, what were the changes that were being made 
and in what direction were those changes made as a function of degree and configuration of hearing loss. And what we actually end up, ended up finding when we examined the data that had been pulled back from over a million hearing aid fittings. Oh, that's was, a lot. <laughs> yeah, was that hearing aid fittings were not being changed from the initial prescription by more than typically about 2 dB. And that more than 90% of all of the fittings that were done were being done with the manufacturer's fitting algorithm. So you, on the one hand, you had these academically verified and validated fitting algorithms that we know give patients better audibility, which is the key concept, right? Make things audible, then your brain will figure out what to do with it. Uh, and on the other hand, you had this algorithm that nobody really knows what goes into it, and it could change from this week to next week. Uh, with no notice, no warning, no explanation. But 90 plus percent of the fittings were being done with the manufacturer one because that was the default that came up when you clicked best fit. So you had this idea of the patient coming in, spending a bunch of money on getting what they thought was a treatment plan. And the professional would put the audiogram in and click best fit and say, well, how's that sound? How does that person know what it's supposed to sound like? They have hearing impairment, right? They're adapting to something new. And so this was a real shock to us. Um, and where the places where we noticed that there were the biggest variations in terms of the fitting changes from target were when people were using a particular algorithm that was used for pediatric fittings, which makes a lot of sense because those types of fittings are the ones that are most likely to be verified using probe microphone measurements. And gradual. And yeah. So, uh, so that was a, an interesting study, but also a kind of disappointing one. When you think about how much variability there is in the sound pressure level that's achieved in a person's ear, depending upon how big their ear is, how long the cable is, uh, which type of receiver or speaker is used, what the venting characteristics of the ear mold are. To think that those changes were 2 dB was incredibly disappointing uh, because it just means that for roughly half of the people, you're probably over amplifying in some frequency regions. And for the other half of the people, you're probably under amplifying. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, my big thing is I always tell my patients, you know, uh, there's a difference between a seller of hearing aids and a treater of hearing loss. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, many people go to sellers of hearing aids, right? And they're not actually getting care and they're not getting a custom prescription. So for the listeners, to, from my perspective, the prescription is what you receive programming is what you do, right? And because sometimes I ask people, do they program it? And programming is not necessarily just hooking it up to the computer. Programming is actually perhaps doing custom changes. So you get a custom prescription for your ear, which is, I yeah. think, what you're talking about. Right. And so you achieve that prescription and have verified that you have achieved that. Right. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, so I was pretty, you know, as you know, I was interested in seeing the study just because that's kind of looking behind the curtain. Uh, if you will. And so, you know, one of the other things that uh, people should understand is, is, is the high tones are particularly people are sensitive when they are first exposed to them initially. And so people should think of it like, you know, when you go from a dark room to bright light, of course, the bright light uh, uh, bothers your eyes. And so if people were to like take you out of a dark room and put a flashlight in your eyes, they'd say, is that too bright? Everybody would say it's too bright. The answer is not, is it too bright? When you come out of the darkness, the answer is, is it too bright? You know, 90 days later when you're no longer in the darkness, right? So it's that mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. And I think that that's particularly true when you're focusing all of the amplification in one frequency region. Uh, some of High the tones usually, right? Right, right. And, and because of the way that the, we tend to fit as in couple devices to people's ears with open fit devices nowadays. Yeah. Uh, it becomes very difficult to balance the stridency of those high frequency sounds with a bass response. And 
because of the way that our cochlea actually integrates energy to allow us to perceive loudness, when we are only when we're providing predominantly more amplification in the high frequencies to achieve a perception of loudness, I'm getting something from this, we end up messing up that frequency distribution between the lows and the highs. Can you explain and, that? I, 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 yeah. I can't for a uh, armchair a pseudo uh, person who knows anything about that, I don't really. That's why I'm asking you that. So <laughs> tell me sure. that, that concept. So let's let's step back a second and think about um, someone playing a nice piece of music on a piano keyboard. Okay. A well trained and talented pianist will make use of the the chords in the bass to support the melody that's carried in the high frequencies or the high high uh, pitched keys whereas your uh, brother's toddler who's pounding away on only the high keys going bing 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 or playing twinkle twinkle little star that's not a particularly uh, pleasant, pleasant experience and it can be rather jarring right uh, if you combine the high frequencies with the low frequencies, the way that our cochlea and our brain processes the energy that's present allows us to achieve a bigger or louder representation of overall loudness with less overall amplification. Whereas if we only were providing energy in the high frequencies, you have to provide a lot of it to be able to get that overall perception of loudness up to a normal level. Interesting. Yeah, I never really thought about it, but it's the pleasant pleasantness of having the whole whole frequency spectrum, I think, is if I can boil it down to my simplistic understanding. Yeah, yeah. And I think that a lot of the research that and, and sort of conventional wisdom about fitting and adjusting hearing aids for people has been sort of handicapped by the the limitations of the technology uh -huh. in in that uh you know you have a limited bandwidth of frequencies over which you can provide really useful audibility for for speech level sounds and so in order to achieve the perception of normal loudness for someone with hearing impairment you as well as providing good speech intelligibility or understanding ability, you have to emphasize certain frequencies. And this can lead to that a further disruption of that overall balance of things that people with normal hearing don't experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it's fascinating stuff in terms of all of these uh, differences and, and what people uh, experience. There. I mean, you know, one of the other things that's kind of like built into the industry that people don't realize is how, you know, you're talking about return rates. You know, I have a substantial number of patients who have either low end of normal or very mild hearing losses have been mm -hmm. told by many people they shouldn't get hearing aids. And some of them are the most fast, most satisfied users, right? Yeah. And the, th the thing is, is some of the providers don't even realize they're not doing it because they're afraid of a return. So they've been trained don't try to fit that because they're likely to return, which is actually kind of ironic because they do better. And, you know, I talked to uh, Ryan McCreary at um, Boys Town and he, you know, the mm -hmm. evidence is getting pretty clear that even low within normal limit hearing loss has a pretty significant uh, functional impairment. So it's kind of ironic that the, the industry is actually in some ways perpetuating non-treatment of things that should be treated and can be easily treated. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And this whole idea of hidden hearing loss, right, or subclinical hearing loss is a really interesting one that is is really kind of exacerbated by the fact that our diagnostic tests are only detection of pure tones, right? which is not an ecologically valid test in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. Well, and arbitrarily picking certain frequency ranges to skip, right? Right. Yeah, and it, it's a it's a classification tool in my mind uh, that is a, a useful predictor of how you might want to prescribe amplification in order to achieve a normalization of loudness in each frequency band, but it's not uh, really a true quantification of the individual's hearing experience. 
Yeah. So the, you know, again, I'm a simple guy. I try to analogize this. The, the thing I always tell people is like the audiogram is like an EKG, right? It tells you is the ear healthy or not, right? The EKG tells you is the heart healthy or not. It gives you some suggestion of what's going on. But if you want a functional test, you do a stress test. And so if you want a functional test of the ear, you do aided testing or something like that, where you're really trying to do speech and noise with a binaural benefit with instrumentation. To me, that's really figuring out how people hear. Yeah, no, I'm not that kind of doctor on the EKG thing, but uh, I'm totally with you on the, the functional sort of um, environmental testing, right? Like understanding what is the benefit that's actually being realized for this individual and, and what is the value of some of the signal processing techniques that might be applied for that person, environmental noise reduction, right. directional microphone technology, uh, venting versus not venting the fitting, all of these things can have a big impact on that overall performance that the person achieves. Yeah, no, I, and that's a, it is, there's such an art to really getting people to maximum uh, benefit. And so, you know, what it really leads to, uh, which, you know, when I first started, you know, doing my own personal deep dive in this, what alarmed me was that only 20% of people were treating hear their hearing loss as well. So only one in five people who should get their hearing loss treated. And so that to me is a problem. But the other one is what we're kind of alluding to is, is okay, so you take 100 people, 20 of them have hearing treatment. Well, it seems to me, even of those 20, maybe 15 or more actually are undertreated or not adequately or appropriately treated. So it's not just the people who don't have hearing aids, which is a problem in and of itself that we have to tackle, but even the people who have hearing aids. And I think that's somewhat worse because they actually think they're treating it when they're not right. Like, you know, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Uh, and there was another statistic that came out a few years ago from the, uh, American Academy of Audiology, looking at fitting practices that, uh, what are the actual, uh, gold standards of, of practice. And, uh, you know, you and I would laugh about the term gold standard because really it means it's what everybody else does, right. not necessarily what the best thing is, but I'm trying to use it in the, in the, from the perspective of what's the best thing to do. So, so ideal standards or yeah, best, best practice is, right, right. would be to use a validated fitting target and match to that target using a real ear probe microphone system right. where you're actually measuring the sound pressure level at the eardrum. And only about 20 to 25% of providers were using real ear measurements. Not using it all the time. And they don't use it all the time. That's right. So they might use it at a first fit, but then they make a whole bunch of changes and never check to see what came of it, which is, again, kind of disappointing. It would be kind of like going to the ophthalmologist or optometrist and they go through and they test your vision very you know, extensively, both using the, the deaf protect table and also doing the astigmatism tests and the uh, um, glaucoma tests and things. And then the next time you come back to them, they just say, well, so, so how are you seeing? Right. Well, not great. Oh, well, um, well, we can, we can make the prescription a little stronger. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, I've even through my clinical practice, maybe I'm over to the other side. I just basically tell patients, I don't think you can perceive your own hearing loss. I just don't think people are very, I mean, I don't know if there's studies out there of what people think their hearing loss and what they really, it really is, but people underestimate their hearing loss by far. So if they can't do that, there's no way for, that they really should be able to assess how well they're rehabilitated. So I think a lot of people have hearing aids and it's less bad, if that makes sense, rather than good. Yeah, I don't remember if we talked about the last time I was on the show, but uh, my dissertation was actually looking at people's confidence in their responses right. when they were in difficult listening situations. Did we talk about a little? We didn't go too deep in it. But. Yeah, so it was really interesting to see that individuals with hearing impairment tended to report greater confidence in their response than their performance would suggest. Right. And so, so the analogy I use is going to blood pressure, right? Like, so if your blood pressure is 210 over 110, and then we give you a blood pressure pill, you could say it's treated. It's like getting hearing aids. But if it's 160 over 90, it's treated. It's just not 
well treated and people understand that numerically. And so it's got it. That's why you have to measure it, right? Like, interestingly, yeah. if you went to your primary care doctor, they said, hey, Drew, you, you have high blood pressure. I'm going to give you a pill. And you never got it measured again. They never checked it again. And they left you on that pill in perpetuity. You think they're a quack. You, you would, you'd never go back. So it's kind of yeah. fascinating that the consumer doesn't, the patient doesn't understand that that's essentially what's happening to them on the hearing aid side. Yeah, well, it also points to a, a deficiency in the way that we in the, I'll say the entire medical industry have kind of communicated about the value of the device versus the value of the expertise of the clinic. Right. The service side, I agree a thousand percent. Yeah, and, and we, you know, we bundle pricing so that people can compare easily and shop here, shop there. Oh, I got really cheap hearing aids at big box store X. Well, congratulations. I hope you picked up some toilet paper along the way, right? And the flat but, screen TV. Yeah, and a flat screen TV and maybe a rotisserie chicken. But d- did you actually get your money's worth in terms of actually addressing the problem that you went in there for versus going to a, a true professional clinician like yourself or like many of the others that that we know in the community who are so focused on finding out what problems and goals the patient is experiencing, you know, how they want to address those and finding the solution that really best meets their needs and demonstrating that benefit through applying their expertise. Right, right. Uh, and and it, we were chatting about this earlier, but there's all of this data that's floating around and starting to become more uh, obvious in the in the media as well as in the general scientific literature about this link between untreated hearing impairment and dementia. and cognitive decline and dementia. Yeah. <clears throat> but there's less data out there about how it's treated. Uh, I think that some people assume, well, I got some hearing aids, so I've solved that problem, headed that one off, everything's good here. But there is starting to be some very interesting and highly directional data coming out that would suggest that how you treat that loss matters matters a lot. And the efficacy or effectiveness of that treatment is driven by audibility and uh, the functional bandwidth that can be achieved for the listener. So how broad a range of pitches are they able to hear based on, you know, with and without the device? And uh, there was a paper that was published out of Anu Sharma's lab at the University of Colorado that's looking at neuroplasticity, so changes in the brain the auditory cortex and the association areas that are attached to the auditory cortex in individuals with hearing loss. And they were able to show using functional MRI, so an actual measurement of the functioning of the brain in response to sound stimuli, that people who uh, had been without amplification for a long time had changes in the functioning of their brain in those areas. It just didn't light up anymore in response to sound. When they were fit with well-fit hearing aids that actually provided them with audibility in those frequency ranges, over time with repeated uh, MRIs, you could see that those areas were starting to be reignited. You know, they're lighting up again. What was the timeline on that? Do you recall? Um, I, would months, go, though, right? I would have to go back to the paper, but it's several months. Right. And so that's yeah. actually one of the things people have to understand. Like, it's not, this it's is not tough. uploading an app. You're not putting an app on your head. You have to adapt and it takes time. Yeah. And, and it's, think of it as a dimmer switch. It's not an on off switch, right. right? You need to repeatedly re-expose those areas to these stimuli to reinforce the connections between the neurons in the brain. Uh, and so over time, they showed essentially a return to normal functioning in those areas that had previously gone dark and were not responding 
to the South. But what was really interesting was they wondered, well, is it just a matter of having hearing aids? And is this person engaging in more situations? It, um, you know, are there other factors at play here? So they looked at a group of patients who had hear, were fit with hearing aids, but didn't have well-fit devices. They didn't have the audibility in those frequency regions, and they didn't have the changes either. Oh, so even if they were more social or all of those, uh, it controlled for everything. And it really, what you're basically saying is you really got to get the blood pressure down to 120 over 80, not uh, still have some mild hypertension by using my exam. That's right. You not only need to buy something, but you need to have it set up appropriately for you. It's treatment. It's not just a device. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, one of the things when I talk to patients, I think they really get is, you know, home repair and craftsmen. I always say, you know, we can all get a bunch of bricks and mortar dumped in our backyard, but the mason builds the wall. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it doesn't matter, man. A bad mason with great bricks is not going to get you a great wall, no matter and, what. And laying bricks is really hard. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> I've tried. It, it seems like it's easy, but it's actually hard <laughs> to get them level and, and get the mortar to look right and all that. Yeah. It's actually really hard. To do. I agree. I, I, I actually have watched and tried a little, and I actually did take the project on myself. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and so it, it actually kind of all ties together, right? So you have to treat your hearing loss to help your cognition but you need the hearing devices fit well. And so, I mean, it really kind of circles all around to, you know, and this is why I was wanted to talk to you was that poster, because I was, you know, to be frank with you, I was blown away by mm -hmm. how many people, I, I, I quote patients that it's 80% are factory settings, but I think it probably is 85 or 90% of factory yeah. settings. And so, you know, I, I think the other comment is, is, you know, as you and I both know, what OTCs or over-the-counter hearing devices are coming. And at some point, why would you pay for somebody to give you factory settings when you can just get the factory settings yourself, right? And so those people really, you know, we really need to, if people want to continue in this field, they need to step up their game and make sure that people are truly treated. Yeah, I, I entirely agree with you. I think that there, we're kind of at a crossroads now where the technology has progressed enough that you can provide people with at least a decent listening experience, if not optimized benefit with devices that don't require a lot of intervention. And that is kind of sad uh, because it turns not optimized and, you know, frankly, substandard into the going expectation. Right. Uh, but I, people I think want that, high performance if they know it's available and it matters. Some sure. people, right? Yeah. Um, until we have the ability to both assess an individual's hearing in a meaningful way, as well as measure the response of that device when it's coupled to your unique anatomy, however, right. those devices will remain essentially the equivalent of the ear trumpet, you know, right. one size fits none. Uh, and we will see how the, how the industry evolves. But I think that right now uh, it's very clear to everyone who has a background in hearing, background in medicine, a background in medical devices, that there's a, a reason why devices that are provided through a professional are more expensive, but also why they're more valuable. Right. Agree a hundred percent. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of pressures coming, right? Mail order, OTC. And so in a lot of ways, uh, this will probably separate out the people who are giving, you know, you're going to have to demonstrate that you're really elevating people's audition or hearing to uh, warrant that. And yeah, I mean, that's everywhere, right? I mean, you really have to deliver, not just convince people that you deliver. I mean, that's where I've, I've just really come to believe that you need objective measures to demonstrate um, that things. I mean, I'll tell you a, a very close person to me, uh, he had died of complications of high blood pressure. And I asked him, well, why didn't you treat your blood pressure? And you know what his answer was? I felt fine. Right. So the point was, he didn't believe that the objective evidence of the high blood pressure actually existed. And so it's kind of interesting, the same from a hearing point of view. 
we measure things and we treat them to the point where they're treated adequately, not just what you believe to be adequate. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, good point. Well, this has been really great, Drew. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a topic that I, you know, I wanted to explore and talk about and have talked and and really is I think important to everybody to understand where the current state of, of hearing aids. And I know at some point we'll get together and talk about why your lens is different um, and, uh, you know, talk about that. And it's a great technology. And I think, you know, watching this and then watching the next episode of why your lens with different will give people in a pretty amazing picture of the differences and why it might be something that they want to consider and why I'm involved in it, because I know audiologically it does a lot for people. But I really appreciate you coming Drew. people. I always ask this. Oh, actually, my one question I ask everybody, what's your favorite sound? Oh, I think it's Jimmy Page's guitar or a Porsche 911 with race mufflers. Oh, there you wow. go. Those are those are some pretty good. Times. <laughs> well, the reason I ask people that is because imagine, you know, for anybody, as you have that passion about it, what if that wasn't in your life anymore? Right. And that's that's hearing loss. Right. When those things that you love are no longer there. Right. And And the worst part is you don't even realize they're not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, and how they've degraded over time. It's a, it's a sad, insidious loss, but it's something that we can address and yeah. make a huge difference in people's lives. Agreed. And uh, frankly, I wouldn't have this podcast if I didn't think that that was the case. I mean, that's really kind of the thrust of the podcast and the book. And so, um, it drew, I was asking, how, how do people get a hold of you if they want to get a hold of you? Earlens's website, I assume? Yeah, right. through Earlens's website, www.earlens.com uh, is the easiest way to get a hold of us. And um, always happy to take questions from your, your listeners and from anyone else in the community. And I agree that the talk that we had today just about audibility and how important it is to people will be a great foundation for talking about how ear lens is different and uh, can provide people with a great uh, value and in addition to a great outcome. So if you're just watching this episode when it's released, you're going to have to wait for his next episode. If you're watching this retrospectively, uh, go ahead and jump ahead to Drew's next episode on ear lens. Uh, again, this is uh, Drew, Drew, Dr. Drew Dundas. He is the chief technology officer of ear lens. And uh, again, thanks for coming. This has been a great conversation. My pleasure. I look forward to chatting again soon. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.